getting into the the topic of totems first of all what is a totem mm. and what is its purpose in the african context so when we speak of totemism and animism because basically it's always important to go back from a foundational point as to what actually are we speaking about so animism is what informs having totems in your bloodline and what animism is is that we look at um, the natural environment and animals not only as a sort of a um, instinctual being or another sort of being but we see divinity within animals so it means that certain lessons are learned from animals in our african spirituality our ancestors learned um the ethno medicine ways of healing which is umuti ditari mirian to use them by observing by observing animals in their natural environments because animals don't go to doctors mm. they they self medicate it's something that is inherently built into their instincts much like dogs know that when they not feeling while they having digestive problems they will chew grass so that um they either help we get all of that out or if they bile is full they will also then palaza mm-hmm. but the palaza is and we as african people palaza which is purging so that's an observance where different animals would have different than trees or leaves or shrubs that they would eat in 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 pertinence to how they are structured animism has many layers but it's just to say to stru- an understanding of it an idea of it is basically the observance of nature to innovate the observance of nature to be able to learn the observance of nature to be able to know how to live within the in in coexistence with the environment because animals are instinctually aligned with the natural rhythms and cycles of nature in all of the seasons they know inherently what it is that they need to do mm-hmm. so animism then when it's then a practice would then be totemism where each tribe would have a particular totem that they attributed to so that idea when we look at totemism first to introduce it is that in in our royalty because you understand that we have royal lineages and coming from a communal background as african people um ubukosi or the monarchy is very important within the within the structure of the community it is basically the place that brings together all of the people in the community so you find that much like now there is the lion king where we speak of simba as the king of the jungle also in our african totemism when you look at it universally all over africa is that all kings have an association with um the leopard skin and also with the um, with the um, with the uh, lion skin yeah. and that's why they'll speak of ingwenyama the great lion and that is also to signify the fa- fact that in nature when it comes to predators lions generally are the most dominant in the same way as a king then must also emulate things um behaviors like a leopard leopards are very ingenious they are very sentient if we could put it like that and sentient meaning that their thoughts processes are very unique it's not a very instinctual thing they are able to innovate outside of their spaces they're able to live in solitary in, in in solitude and be with themselves so that they can understand the core as to how they can traverse so many spaces because that's another thing about um about about leopards is leopards can live in a variety of environments mm. and that's because of the the type of character that leopards have so we see that in animal totemism firstly within that within royalty and when we then go into the bantu people bantu we we come across the understanding that animal totemism informs a lot of not just the royalty but a lot of the bantu people in terms of how they recognize divinity if we went before the colonial interruption and we went into maybe older sort of bantu clans mm-hmm. we like your kalanga people we understand that most people who are in africa who are of the of bantu descent who have animal totems in the clan praises or just as they as as a family totem is a recollection back to the kalanga people mm-hmm. so animals totems help to identify almost in the same way as how e- the way you dress in a particular way when you dress in orange and red and you shave your head everybody understands that you're a buddhist monk so animal totemism in terms of the representation because the people would then often have something of the animal representative in the way that they even adorned themselves or things that they used would then also show and would be a signifier as to 
where do you come from? Mm. So animal totemism within the Kalanga people was very important because the Kalanga nation is basically a nation that was very much in touch with nature and the cosmos. So each and every one, firstly, of these surnames or, or, or homes, different bloodlines that had animal totems, they were firstly cons uh, nature conservationists. It was to be able to then say that if we have almost every single of the animals that would be a threat or would be threatened by human existence, if they each then belong and are seen as the same as your father, or, and, or your mother or your brother, they are kin to you, they are an elder to you, mm. then there would be a certain kind of protection that you'd have. And if you now then stretch this out to all of the animals around the area, then what you'd have is that you'd have nature that would not be interrupted and would be protected because there'd be an understanding of the divinity of those animals. Mm. There's no separation between us as humans and the way we, we see the animals as, as totems. Totemism within then modern, modern times because it's very important to not remain in a static sort of space where we'll reminisce about the time of Gualanga and those great empires. Mm -hmm. But animal totemism still exists within all of our lineages. We look at it from Mazulu and the Guni people. You have people that are Bagangwen and the totem is a crocodile. And within that crocodile, they understand that if they go to a certain particular place in a river and they see a crocodile, it's not an aggressor, but it's actually a manifestation of the divine. It's a message from the source, the creator. It's a message also from their ancestors, passed through their ancestor, which is the crocodile. Mm. In the same way as in your Kosa people that believe in Umajol, Majola is a snake. Mm. When it, it is understood in um, Omajola that they will speak and narrate that in a lot of the experiences when a new child was born, they'll walk in and find the child and the snake Umajola will be there and they will not threaten or harm, harm the child. So that animal totemism also translates into how people then deal and interact with it. You see it also in your Sutu people. Kharbuaka, your northern Sutu people, which is many tribes from your Lobedus to your Mapulana to your Pedi people to your Bahatlam. You know, there's quite a large group of northern Sutu people and your southern people, Sutu people that come then from what would be then Lesotho and your western Sutu speakers, which would be your Tswana people. All of them speak of in the northern Sutu, it will be like Reana Malopo, and Malopo is then for a totem. It signifies a certain animal totem. Um, in the southern Sutu, they will speak about um, Muluku, which is your animal totem. Um, we go into your, way, your Tswana people, they speak around then um, what would be said to be Ubina Ing. So Babangwe, Babina Nuku, Babina Ing. And these are interchangeable also within the people. So each and every one of your Bantu people, because Ban Vunabu Besutu come also from the super tribe, what could be understood as the, as the Bantu people, mm. they particularly still keep a deep connection within it where every single family has a particular totem. And that totem then informs also where it is that you would go for spiritual connection. Mm. As we've spoken about before, if your totem is an eagle, you would then understand that the natural environment where an eagle stays and everything would be inviting to, to, to your ancestors, to your spirit, because that's where you found a source of divinity. But also when we then tap into what we speak of as blood magic, which is um, ancestral connection. In our DNA, the, the memory, our bodies carry the memories that go from centuries and centuries and everything carries a vibration. So you, if you come from a clan that is associated with the eagle and you go to that natural environment, within that space it vibrates things which are familiar to you in your bloodline and you can find that in your spiritual connection, what it will do is then you'll start to open up in your channels, you'll start to dream, you'll start to have a deeper sense of your ancestors coming forward and introducing themselves to you from that lineage along with other supported things just based on, on your totem. So we can basically understand totemism as something that roots us firstly to where we come from, the Kalanga people, Gualang. Because when we, when we sit and we think about it, we do come from 
a very sunny place. So Gwalanga, some people understand it as the east where the sun rises, which is true. Gwalanga also would then speak around coming from the eastern side of Africa, whether it's all the way north or going all the way down, because you find that reference to Gwalanga. So depending on the generation that you look at it from, because even with Egypt, Egypt is northeast. Egypt is northeast, and we understand that the Nubians are Bantu people as well. Mm -hmm. You go back and you look at your um, people in Kenya, and they are because the sun rises there. Yeah. And so the understanding is that in each of those places, because the Bantu people, what is typical about around the Bantu people before the colonial borders and interruption is that they were migratory people. So they moved in, in the same way as nature cycles, in the same way as, 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 you know, and that was firstly to emphasize the fact that they're nature conserva conserv conservationists in the sense that if you stay on land and you, and you farm on it and you graze on it, after a certain time that, that soil becomes tired and it doesn't reap the same thing. So the migration was also to be able to, um, to, to revere nature and also then understanding that we can stay at this place and then we'll migrate to another place. So the movements of the Bantu people and the migration was with the natural communicators that nature would respond to them. If rains were not coming and it had been maybe a drought for a couple of years, mm -hmm. they would then be understood that from the divine source, we must now move to another place. Mm -hmm. And that's why also when you go and you look, it's in, in many places all over Africa, you find where the Bantu people are, there were always these great kingdoms that were then went and were established there. Because, I mean, we speak around, starting from in the north, in the furthest north, we'll speak about Egypt and Kemet. The Bantu people were there. You go so far as Ethiopia, a country which was never colonized, the furthest in the east, it's also Gwalanga, the where the Kalanga people come from. And there you'll find that they, there's a spiritual kingdom where they have the churches that date back and a lot of us who are seeking spirituality have the understanding that the original bible may necessarily come from that area mm -hmm. you then go into what would be your tanzania sofala region great zambezi area you find that there were bantu people there who were trading with arabs trading with indians trading with your chinese people even before the colonial mission of the europeans started where then you'd find around that area of the great Zambezi kingdoms like your great Zimbabwe kingdom, your kingdom of Munamutapa, where the Rosi people and the Kalanga people settled, you go down to South Africa, you will find Mapungubwe, where also your Kalanga people settled and the Zambezi feeds into there. So the understanding also was that in nature, as much as there's a connection to animal totemism that are land-based, but there's also necessarily a connection to the waters. Mm -hmm. So when they migrated as the, as the Bantu people, they always used where the water would then flow, mm -hmm. because where there is water, there is life. Mm -hmm. And so when we then start to go into New Age understandings, that would be then the introduction of um, understandings of when we say Mzawe is a person that stayed at a particular place and they believed in water divinities and they are water-based people. Yeah. And those would be your, typically your surnames like your Ubakwena people because if you go historically into all of the people that have the crocodile totem, you'll find that if you go into the Manika people close to the Nyangani mountains between Zimbabwe and Mozambique, you find your Ntangwenya your people who believe that the divinity is a crocodile. So they connect to that, that is their totem. You find in Swaziland, where we have Ilbombo, there's the Ngwenya Mountains. The Ngwenya people is where all the kings are buried even before the Nbosopuza and them came. And it is, it is where there are caves and it's close to the water. You go into then what would be your Bakwe, Nabako, Murolong, and Yotsana people. They are also high kings that live in very rich mineral places, which is then the other introduction of understanding that Nzawe, as much as it's a water divinity, but it's also an indicator of wealth and prosperity. Because when you look at where all of these clans are, where there is water, there will be prosperity. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the minerals that need to develop are actually forged with water playing an important part in their development. 
So that's the one understanding also that animal totemism helps us to understand is where we would then connect with things such as when we speak of Ingosi and in each place they would be. And in the migration, there were totems that were intentionally placed at spaces to be where they would be trading capitals as well because the rivers were used to be able to then travel and to get to all of those places. So those people understood inherently those, those spaces where if you look and we're carrying on on how totemism, because it doesn't necessarily also, a totem doesn't necessarily also have to be an animal. It could also be a certain connection to um, a certain natural natural elemental force of creation or a natural environment. You, you have Maswati that are said to be Bomanzin. Yes. And when you go into the spiritual journey and the history of the Manzini people, there's a deep connection with when it comes to Bungoma with the water-based sort of healing mm. because the, the totem is then that of the water. Mm. You go into the Nskubegenge Maswati Bomvule Nibomnisi they are rainmakers. Manis Tibasabo, which is actually um the spring. Oh, okay. So the spring is said to in, in their royal lineage in the Mnisis, whoever goes La Payana to go into that um into the water that goes in with um skuniles vutago, which would be a log that's on fire and comes out, is then said to be chosen by the water spirit of their clan mm. that they will be then the ruler. So even the way in which animal totemism or totemism informs us is that naturally even Bukosi is not necessarily defined by because I am a firstborn, I am going to be king. And you find that also similarly in Mapungube, your people, your Kalanga people of Mapungube did not elect a, a ruler based on you are firstborn, you come from the firstborn thing because there was a council of royal elders and spirit would then inform in their connection to whatever totems it is and they would interpret from those totems as to who is the one who is supposed to lead our, lead our, tr our clan mm. to, to, a, to a better existence, to a better future. Mm. So animal, uh, animal totemism, animism and totemism is very important when we look at it firstly from that perspective is that it makes us understand that we as African people naturally understood that there's divinity in nature and we understood the cycles of nature. So it means things like climate change and the environment are inherently also part of the knowledge systems that are learned from this animal animism and animal totemism, mm -hmm. which is why we would have people that would be able to tell that, okay, there's going to be um, a cataclysm and a cataclysm would be like maybe there's going to be great droughts. So you'd have prophets that would connect to that message and pass it on because of the connection with nature from that level. So it served to order the community, it served to connect them to divinity. That's what our totems actually do is how we connect then with our divinity outside of just our blood ancestors.